Mr. Eric, welcome. Hey, guys. <laughs> Highest Good quality to... multimedia production of any podcast I've ever seen. Great. <laughs> one one tries. One tries. That, that was a brand new opener today. What do you think, Rain? What do you think of that? Yeah, I liked it. That was good. You got new music. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. I put it together real quick, so it needs some more details. Like when the the dudes shooting the zombies, I want it to be like I want titles to come up and say like platonic truth bullets or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mainstream media watchers are all like. <laughs> well, it, it's it. funny because it, it has that whole like Arctic. Um, headquarters compound uh vibe to it which is has gotten in our in our our sci-fi and predictive programming in hollywood over over 60 years 70 years 80 years usually there's like an evil vibe to that's where the lair of the villains are the the, the evil geniuses is in some arctic lab that's that's overseeing something <laughs> nefarious but then you're you're inverting it and that's uh, right not anymore no that's yeah. where the, the you could yeah, be the you could bad guys from. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Rain. We'll 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 have to see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as far as the good and evil thing, we might have to get gray, <laughs> gray pilled. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, Rain actually suggested bringing you on. I wanted to open up with this little bit of a geopolitique uh, before we get into tonight's exciting uh, world premiere. Uh, mm -hmm. First, your reaction to the Putin interview. What are your general thoughts and reaction to when that happened? Uh, I I, uh, I loved it. I, I absolutely adored it. And um, and I know a lot of people watching it were a little bit weary about, you know, the typical criticism I've seen is, is his approach when asked the first potent question on, like, why, why are you doing this? And it's like he could have gone for any of these sexier, like, hardcore answers that he said a thousand times over over the last, you know, 20 years regarding the expansion of NATO, the, the attempt to create full spectrum dominance, to have a first, a first strike attempt on Russia um the the color revolutionary efforts by the state departments and cia he could have said all these things but he didn't he went for the 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 the, the thousand year history of russia and the common origins of the russian and ukrainian people and uh and you know i as somebody who has been trying hard to um to to tune my my mind to wire my mind to appreciate the contours of like the more subtle like i i try to look at the more subtle currents of universal history I, I know that that's like the hardest thing for people to like hold on to is the is is what is the context what is the 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 meta story the meta narrative um which which it's easy to give people facts and you'll find that people will receive facts about whatever um the FBI's role in in Martin Luther King's murder or 911 you know facts about the inside job there anything but it doesn't if you don't deal with how they're thinking about everything, they just take on like a, a better opinion about something that they had a stupid opinion about, but they're still, they lack the ability to judge um, the criteria to judge and be thus why like have, have, have access to, to that type of wisdom needed, that insight needed to navigate through the realm of shadows that we that have been cast for us. So Putin really, I think he just was, was, um fed up in a sense <laughs> he he's been giving the facts for so long it's not like the facts are not available for people they could listen to scott ritter mearsheimer anybody like you know there, there's so many things out there well it totally he really had that to... totally had that vibe come up a couple times that he's exasperated yeah with us. he's absolutely what he's like why would i you know, tucker tried to make the big like the big you know star play and and say, hey, give us that journalist and we'll take him out of here right now. Wouldn't that be, you know, he's trying to be a hero and stuff. And Putin's like, why? Why would I do that? Yet again, why would I make another reconciliatory gesture towards the West? I, I've That would be the hundredth one I've done and I'm still waiting for the first one from you guys. Yeah. And he's just like, and, and, and Tucker's like, okay, 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 but why do you invade Russia? And he's like, no, hold on. I'm I'm just at Catherine the Great. We got, <laughs> you know, we got about, you know six hundred years to go here. Oh, we'll we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what I what I love is is the re he reframed it around not being a war between one country and another country, but rather um, a civil war. 
And that's the best way to think about it because it, these are two people with a common origin, origin a common religion. Uh, they, they all have the same founding father, um, Vladimir the Great and Rurik. Like all the Ukrainian and Russian uh, people, they, they're cousins, they're, 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 they're brethren. And it was really kind of more recent in history that Ukraine even became defined as um, a separate nation. It's it's really a brand new phenomenon. And and by by Putin situating it as civil war, it, it I found became um, more real in my mind um, because that's that's the way that the British Empire, with their international deep state operations in in the United States as well as in Russia, have been trying to destroy the United States. They did it the first time try to create civil war in America, right, to induce the United States to destroy itself in the 1860s, saved by Russia. That's the reason why Lincoln was able to hold, hold shit together was because Russia was able to come in and save the U.S. from its own foreign instigated civil war um, that also used a bunch of occultists um, like Albert Pike, the whole southern right and northern branch of the, uh, the Scottish right, which was the transcendentalists of Ralph Waldo Emerson, these were all occultists. They were doing nasty, nasty stuff with, with the northern branch of the Scottish Rite. Both were interfacing with the United Grand Lodge of uh, of the British Empire. That was sort of the mother lodge of the Scottish Rite in both extremes, north and south. And then you had the patriots, right? The people who organized around the Whig Party, who founded the Republican Party in the 1850s, who, who organized to make sure Lincoln was going to be the man to come in and, and try to keep things together. And it wouldn't have worked were it not for his fellow um, great emancipator, um, Tsar Alexander II, who also was sick and tired of the British and also the occult network inside of Russia that worked with occult Freemasonic outfits like the Martinists established by, by a British uh, you know, soldier in the 1730s in Russia that was organizing, that was part of the interfacing of the old families of Russia, the old deep state black nobility of Russia that was trying to, to keep feudalism in place because Alexander II was trying to liberate the serfs. That's what he did in the 18, 1861, same year that, that Lincoln liberate, that passes the, the emancipation, emancipation proclamation. Imagine a world where the, the news reminded us that Russia helped save the, the North in the civil war that, that it bolstered Lincoln. Lincoln's such a hero that. in America. <laughs> hey, I didn't even know that. Yeah, never yeah. Really heard of that. <laughs> it's yeah. in that. It's in that um, documentary I made for that that old Russian uh, guy, um, uh, the other America. Lazansky, Ed, Ed Lazansky, oh, Edward Lazansky. Yeah, it's right, just yeah. been it's just been years since you've seen it, and it would have right. gone by kind of in a minute. But they would cover that, and the, the Russian the Russians saved them navally, and then hung out here like forever everybody was super friendly and there's a statue in moscow it's in, in, it's in moscow of lincoln and and uh the czar and <laughs> i mean yeah. it's, it, yeah. what if they reminded us of that what if they reminded us that that what 15 million of them died to nazis you know and and that they without them i mean they, they, we tell the story over here that america saved the world mm. in world war ii but it was the soviets who did it you yeah know? exactly so I mean, if if they would remind us of that instead of like, oh, and this leads into our next topic, you know, instead of the the crazy dictator megalomaniac killer Putin, um, which is all they all they say, you know, like well, uh, yeah, and 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 just to just to, to to put the cherry on it too, like I mean that's the thing that that that's being tried attempted again in in America is is the 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 international oligarchy like the the some might call it the, the the not the 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 undead british empire is trying to induce the united states to go into a civil war yet again um to accomplish what they failed to do back in the 1860s now they're doing it again with a slightly different technique this time they've captured the federal government so but but it's it's sort of the same sort of battle plan to induce uh the destruction of russia through civil war utilizing uh, Ukraine, as well as in the case of the United States, to split it up. And, you know, you've had a lot of efforts to do the same thing inside of China. Um, again, always with Anglo-American um, manipulative, divisive operations to take synthetic cults, usually operating with an occult intelligence framework, as we had in the 1850s with the uh, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom in China. That was an, an, an Anglo-American um, cult with a, uh, a dude 
from the south of China in the 1850s, right? While the Civil War was 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 about to happen in America, while uh, Russia was being sucked into this Crimean War in uh, with the you know against the Ottomans and the French and the British, uh, that was all that same dense period. And the British were at it again in China, organizing this <laughs> cult that was pseudo Christian with this dude who was obviously given like a proto MK Ultra, a, a school teacher who came out of this experience believing he was the Mas or Jesus's brother. And uh, he created this <laughs> this like um, pseudo communist like no property um, all all women are every man's thing you know and all children don't have parents like he that was the 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 what what Lord Bowring of the British Empire overseeing China had had created while the the Opium War was happening the Second yeah, Opium yeah. War and they created a fifteen year civil war in China. And the British were threatened to recognize this southern faction uh, that wanted to create the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom as the official government of China unless the Beijing or Peking agreed to these massive concessions. Wow. Was, was called, that their name? Taiping? The Heavenly Taiping Kingdom? Heavenly Kingdom was the name of... And who was uh, this guy? The I forgot his name, but it's in oh, okay. uh, I, it's in the Breaking Free of Anti-China PSYOPs book I wrote with, with Cynthia. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, everywhere you look, the British are always doing the same thing. Divide to conquer, induce occult networks to create civil war within a, a country by fa factionalizing it up, balkanizing it up. And that's it right there. Yeah, the breaking free of anti-China psyops. That's right. And uh, and so, yeah, what Putin did was great because he just re he reframed it in the context of universal history. And so he dealt with how people are thinking more than what they're thinking about any particular element. And uh, yeah, I, I was I was impressed. Yeah. So before we get into the next thing, then so 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 Putin's initial thirty minute you know monologue there about the history of Russian Ukraine being the history buff. Would you say everything he said was was accurate? Yeah, nothing he said. My my wife actually did a deep dive, uh, and she wrote this like fifteen thousand word um, his, historic essay just to like cover the ground that he that he brushed over very summarily. And uh, it's on her Substack, CynthiaChung.Substack.com. I'll send you guys a copy of it. But yeah, it's it's solid. His his assessment was generally solid. I I and I don't know enough. I'm not an expert on this topic to say a hundred percent everything. But every everything that I know, it 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 checked off. Right. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he was trying to pull the wool. Or there may be some things that he ended with a bit of an interpretation on his side that I guess people could probably argue about, but I don't think factually well, what did you, or time-wise. What, what did you guys, what did you guys think? Like what, what parts did you find were uh, maybe gray area questionable or? Yeah. Rain, uh, your, your reaction. I, I'd love to hear that. Uh, I don't know if there was any, well, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that he was going over that I just don't have the historical knowledge of. So I couldn't say one way or the other, if he was telling the truth or not. I mean, aside from that, I thought the interview was, was good. It was good to hear him speak uh you know tucker obviously didn't hit him with too many hardball questions but i didn't expect him to mm -hmm. um I, I thought and putin to me said something the thing that what he actually was talking about the hostage that there was a point there when putin specifically said he would love nothing more than to see him go home and i just i, I found that fascinating like i mean whether he was being genuine there or not the fact that he would even say that Hmm. Given the fact that if you know the, the the situation was reversed and this was an American president talking about, say, you know, an ISIS terrorist that they had in custody, hmm. I mean, you know, there's no way they're releasing him from Guantanamo, regardless right. of what happens. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? If the shoe's on the other foot, I would not expect an American president to say, oh, yeah, I'd love to see that person go home. So hmm. I thought that was, that was kind of an interesting thing for Putin to say. And, and, you know, once again, I'm, I'm just shocked that, that the West treats him the, the way the way that they do, given that he seems to be infinitely more reasonable than they make him out to be. Yeah. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's definitely using a much more diplomatic language. Um, you know, Biden's calling him a killer. Uh, all, all of these just like schoolyard <laughs> names. Um, and he's still just speaking with a cool head very diplomatically about people who want to destroy his entire people and nation and kill oh, him. Like, it's, it's wild. <laughs> and, 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 right. and America's experiencing exactly what we are, that they're, they're supposed to be voting for the softy lefty. It's going to come in and, and fully declared he's going to reunite the nation with none of this Trumpian hate speak and stuff like that. 
and then like Biden's State of the Union address. Who wants to be Xi Jinping? Who wants to be Xi? Who would want that? And I'm sitting there like, I'd yeah, control the world's largest country. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll take it. Looks looks like a pretty cool job. Probably a little <laughs> stressful, but it looks pretty cool. What do you What do you mean? Who wants to be and and like is screeching that, going red in the face and calling Putin a killer and stuff. And again, red in the face. You know, just like our glorious leader up here is screeching and yelling and calling names and insulting and stuff like that. It's just so wild to see. Um, so on that, uh, we could maybe go to, um, one of the big things that I think the night that, that rain suggested having you on, it was, uh, Navalny's death. Mm. Yeah. Now rain, what did you know about him? Nothing. Before that <laughs> night. Yeah. Right. I'd come across the name, um, here and there. He was definitely familiar, but definitely from hanging out with, uh, the Canadian Patriot people, I definitely got kind of a secondary angle. So like, you know, I saw that he had died and I was like, ding dong, the witch is dead, you know, <laughs> kind of, uh, no offense, uh, family of Navalny, but you know, I knew that the guy's up to no good. Uh, perhaps two, two questions that'll tie together for you, I'm sure. Um, how do we, whoa, I got balloons. How'd that happen? Cool. cool. Um, what what is the real deal with the what's with the balloons man <laughs> is there some ai that heard you like sing and thought that that was an appropriate time for celebration or something ding <laughs> dong the witch is dead <laughs> balloons <No? laughs> navalny <laughs> navalny triggers balloons um what what is the real deal with navalny because i mean that the headlines were just fawning right i saw one that was like it was as if I'm trying to think Walter Cronkite died and, and, and the, the like Cronkite's final wishes is that we go on searching for the truth. And this was like Naval, the Navalny headline. I think it was Politico or something. It was like his last wishes were that we continue the struggle and stuff. And it's this fawning over this guy and, and just barely not saying that Putin strangled him with his bare hands, basically, yeah. you know, it's what they're, they're trying to get across. And second, after we talk about that, I'd like to know if there's any evidence in any way, real evidence, that Putin's ever had an enemy killed or jailed illegally or anything like that. Yeah, sure. Well, on the first part, Scott Ritter did a, uh, a, a decent uh, dive into Navalny, his background, his bio, his connections to the uh, CIA, the State Department, the National Endowment for Democracy, um, I'll send you guys a link to that. Um, I think he's done the second part by now. But um, what I can say is that it's all very formulaic. I mean, every, everything we've seen, it was conveniently timed, I think, to deflect attention away from what Putin actually said like a week and a half before Navalny was announced dead um, on the, uh, I think it was the 15th of, uh, of February. <clears throat> And the, the Tucker Carlson thing was about a week and a half earlier. And I mean, you got to keep in mind that the, this interview with Tucker Carlson, you, you can't underestimate how much this freaked out the oligarchy um, because over a billion people watched it on, on all platforms so far. And that was like an assessment from already um, when Navalny died, a billion people had watched it. I don't know how many more now, but what was done, that was like the first time so many people on this earth had access wide access to a whole thought that Putin delivered without being cut out of context and reframed by Mockingbird Media. That was the first time everyone had access to that for two hours straight, right? Just hear him develop a whole thought and then another whole thought. And there's a lot of, a lot of truth bombs in there. So that, that undid a, a, an immense amount of effort to create a false image in the minds of a lot of people. So it broke down mental barriers. So I think a big, Part of that was timed partially to deflect attention away from what he said. Number two, it was, I think, timed very appropriately for some to coincide with the Munich Security Conference, which was basically a massive beg manding campaign on the part of Zelensky. Uh, Navalny's wife was conveniently there at the Munich Security Conference to uh, to give a speech asking for more billions that are being held that were being held up. 
by uh, elected governments across Europe. Um, and so she was conveniently right on site, on cue to give that speech um, when it was announced that he was dead. And, and sure enough, all of those barriers, the, 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 the resistance to get to unleashing more money into, uh, you know, pouring more military contracts into the death machine and the meat grinder that is Ukraine, where over, you know, 400 million young men have already died unnecessarily in this proxy war. So they, they, the, those, those barriers were gone. The money was unleashed. Germany, France unleashed massive capital and signed new mil, uh, security pacts with Ukraine. Justin Trudeau immediately went straight down to Ukraine with a $3 billion uh, military package and a special ag uh, relationship agreement with uh, Ukraine and Canada, another one. Um, so it was convenient. It benefited Putin. What I could say is, is that Navalny's death definitely did not benefit Putin in any way. Uh, he was a non-factor in a gulag. He was filmed. Everyone in Russia has watched the the filming of him interfacing in 2012 with um, a, 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 a British a, a British MI6 operative from the British embassy at some re posh restaurant in uh, Moscow. And Navalny's assistant was right there asking for like $20 million from MI6 another 20 million dollars is what he's asked for asking for <laughs> to destabilize russia some more and going through detail of what he could do with the, with this money representing navalny and it was being recorded um and that again went viral everyone in R russia watched that he was a non-factor so the fact that he was caught guilty for a whole bunch of things uh this being one element of what he was known for as a foreign agent he has very little support i think it's less than eight percent of mostly millennials in, in Moscow and like the, the cosmopolitan region of like St. Petersburg and Moscow. That's where you get the, the biggest densities of stupid young people is in these cosmopolitan <laughs> zones. Uh, that's where his, his support entirely exists. It doesn't exist anywhere outside of these areas in any significant degree. So he had no, he was not a, um, a viable political opponent to, to Russia, despite what he's been framed as by CNN and, and Western media. Um, and I, I look at um, the fact that, like, I don't know how he died, like, who, who offed him, but I would say um, recent reports have made it clear that he did get a visit from his wife right before she went to the Munich Security Conference. He also got a visit from his lawyer who uh, gave him packages. Um, his wife gave him packages, as I've, been, I've read from a report, of medicines and snacks. I don't know. I'm not saying I know, but these are things that I'm sure the Russians are looking seriously at. Um, the latest the latest report I saw actually had him dying of a blood clot that let loose, apparently, according to some medical examiner. Okay. See, I don't know. How do you induce a blood clot? I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a physician. I wonder if he was up on his boosters. Oh, yeah. there goes YouTube. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You said it. <laughs> and it. Yeah. So, So is it generally considered that he died unnaturally? Well, my, is my that mind, hearing rain? Oh, no, no, right. those natural, natural causes. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's but the official still messaging. Killed him. The official messaging is it was natural causes. So yeah. the Russians are Which saying that. you expect, that. yeah. Yeah. Um, the Russians, that's their official messaging. I don't know whether they actually are. I don't think they believe that. I don't believe that, but whatever. I mean, that's the, there's certain language you got to use in the diplomatic world for whatever reason. Um, now, he, historically, he goes back as fully a Western-backed shit disturber, right? Yeah, Yale. Um, he, he was a part of the Yale Foreign Student Graduate Program of 20, 2009. Um, he was always working with uh, Maria Gaidar, the daughter of um, Yegor Gaidar, one of the Soros reformers of the 80s and 90s who oversaw Perestroika with Anatoly Chubai. Chubai being... Um, both, well, both Anatoly Chubai and, and Gaidar were, on, were the two point men who oversaw the technocratic um, overhaul, the creation of a new technocratic um, elite in the 90s that interfaced with the new billionaire class of basically sociopathic um, freaks who would be granted billions of dollars of formerly state that they would then run as private, um, you know, private toys for the CIA and they would be granted billions in mansions as as a as a 
a reward for being their little mafia, you know, bulldogs within this new structure. And they were always overseen by these technocrats. Now, Igor Gaidar and Anatoly Chubai um, worked with Berezovsky, the multi-billionaire who became, he was, a, I mean, there, there was a lot of these guys. Anyway, they, they also brought in uh, Davos. So the whole World Economic Forum was brought into Russia by these guys in 1999. Uh, the, the Gaidar Forum was set up in 2009 as the Russian Davos in St. Petersburg. Um, the year so died and people again blamed it on Putin. Um, his, his daughter, Maria Gaidar, again, was one of the handlers of, uh, of Navalny. Um, they worked closely together on a couple of political projects. Again, he was brainwashed, like he was sent to, to Yale as part of his rebranding because before he went to Yale in 2009 or 2010, before that, he was, his assignment was to rally all of the right-wing pro-Nazi organizations of Ukraine um against islam against uh, the russian state against putin that was his job and he, he had embarrassing commercials that came back to haunt him holding like a gun up talking to his fellow white supremacist brethren um oh, of the, the former soviet republic saying this is what we do to uh when we see a mosquito we squat it when we see an arab <laughs> we shoot it and he actually like took his gun and he made a like ghost a ghost shot uh all right so he that was a bad image for him and they needed to rebrand him a little bit they did it yeah, so he came yeah. back and became this anti-corruption freedom fighter yeah um yeah and then, and then he, he's he's all soros tied and i mean yeah. uh two of the the biggest mind blows i've had since hooking up with canadian patriot press and you and cynthia chung as well is that Perestroika is an op, and Tiananmen Square is an op. Yeah, <laughs> those have been just like the what? I thought I was clever. I thought I was figuring things out. But I mean, <laughs> I, I clung to to those. I thought Gorby and Perestroika were just the most wonderful things, and <laughs> Tiananmen Square was a, an absolute, you know, crushing of their own people by the the Chinese government. And I mean, we know. We know better now. Yeah, I, but it's, I, it's some of this stuff's hard, man. <laughs> yeah, some dude. of this stuff's hard. You got to let go of some serious shit. So Navalny's in with that crowd, and what's yeah. his name, Peter Swedenhead, that was in China doing the the um, the reports on the the secret police stations. And they had him oh. in jail. It's Peter, what? isn't it? Yeah, Peter. Peter oh, I'm forgetting his name. The, the, yeah, yeah, the, Peter the Swedish guy. guy or the. Yeah, they yeah. had him in jail, and same thing. Uh, you know, freedom fighter hero is put in jail in China for while he was secretly running around gathering billionaires and and officials to commit treason against the Chinese government. So they arrested him. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and then he comes out with like a totally fake report about they're 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 right next to you. They have a secret police station right around the corner. They're coming for you. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's so uh, we report on it like it's an absolute fact. It's just bonkers. So yeah. so basically, Navalny was just an operative. What did they put him in jail for? We're we're gonna get into the the show pretty soon. We'll we'll put a we'll put a button on this shortly. We're half an hour in. Uh, so they they jailed him at some point for for what corruption. For... Um, but I don't remember Scott Ritter's uh work on his Substack goes through a lot of the details. Yeah. Um. So I'm not gonna. I would I would refer people to Scott Ritt, Scott Ritter's overview. It's nice, or even I think Wikipedia would would do a good job at just giving the official <laughs> right. like what they got him for. Yeah. Um. But it had some some elements of corruption, some other things too. Where it was a list of five or six items. Mm -hmm. Righto. Cool. Any. I would just say one thing too for Canadians. Yeah. Um. You know, the, there's the story right of the two Michaels, the two heroic Michaels who were jailed in China, for China's like retaliation for us having um arrested ming one one joe or the the the, the, the CFO Huawei of, uh, Huawei. girl yeah, yeah yeah um well michael Kovrig and michael spavor um you know the chinese were saying like these guys are doing espionage um we're we're not going to just let them go now there's a lot there's a massive massive network of uh cia operatives and CSIS operatives all over China less so now than it was the case 10 years ago less so than it was five years ago but it's still significant and uh and everyone was told in Canada that's a giant Chinese lie they're just you know in it for revenge blah 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 today you know what, what happened not today but but a couple of months ago Michael Spavor 
um, sued the Canadian government and Michael Kovrig, who he was friends with, because Michael Kovrig was the one who was the, uh, he was on George Soros's, um, George Soros created an organization called the, um, oh, it, it'll, it'll come back to me. George Soros created an organization to get intelligence and hotspots around the world to feed back into NGOs and governments and military to make decisions about where do you, uh, how do you how do you frame your military strategies in the Middle East, in uh, in Tibet, in Xinjiang, in Africa? Uh, crisis crisis group, the International Crisis Group, the ICG, right? So uh, Michael um, Kovrig was an employee for the International Crisis Group before going to work uh, for the Canadian government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then being set up as the third in command of the Canadian Embassy in Beijing. And so, and Spavor was a guy who was doesn't seem like he was all that sophisticated. He seems like actually he was duped a little bit to play into a game that Kovrig had set up for him. Uh, but he was he was the the guy who was based in North Korea. And he's the one who brought in like De Dennis Rodman to meet up with Kim Jong-un. He was doing some pretty good work actually on, on the diplomatic, you know, bridge building front. He brought in the Canadian hockey team into North Korea too. Like good stuff he was doing. But anyhow, he got pulled into some weird, weird operation to take pictures of... Um, of infrastructure that China was building in North Korea and then planted under some tree, which was then picked up later by an agent of Kovrig that was then given to Kovrig, Kovrig's handles, uh, handlers. Anyway, I'm saying all of this because now, um, after they were given their heroes welcome back to Canada, um, Spavor is suing Kovrig and the Canadian government for entrapping him into an espionage plot. <laughs> <laughs> For real, yeah, for real, and I mean, it's so, wow. and of course, the, our, our media is completely like mouth sealed on this because I haven't even heard, heard a word about the narrative. This. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the two angel Michaels, and one of them is you know, totally innocent, is suing the government for forcing him to be a spy, basically. Yeah, yeah, and the other, and he's suing the other Michael too. <laughs> oh, well, he's at it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's hilarious, brilliant. Uh, that's the, add that to the list of Trudeau scandals. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't even keep track anymore. No. Nope. Oh. Arrive scam. That's that's the best. To how many millions to four guys in a basement that can't code? <laughs> what, what was this? What was arrive scam? I actually don't know about this. Uh, uh, Rain, you you read up on it most recently. It was something like twenty five or thirty million dollars went to yeah, the company. Somewhere between twenty and forty million dollars that was granted, given basically to, and I thought it was just two guys, but maybe it was four. Let's, you, I mean, either number is ridiculous. So let's go with four. Four guys, literally in a basement in Quebec, who didn't know how to code, didn't know how to write anything, and they were given this contract of twenty to forty million dollars for the Arrive Can app. And there's basically nothing to show for it and where did the money go and who cares and nobody used the app anyway. And, and we, we spent yeah. like a billion dollars on it. An absolute <laughs> failure, but got everyone's data. Mm. You know, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. In any normal universe, any one of these scandals would have brought the government down, but we figured a way around that. We got King Trudeau now. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you look at what was his personal, his personal wealth expanded from like when he when he entered into the into politics in 2013 as an MP and then became prime minister like you, I, I remember watching a graph or I saw a graph somewhere that showed his his personal wealth skyrocket from like 13 million dollars to something absurdly high like yeah it's high double digits I, now yeah high like high like I mean, he's done well yeah. I think when he first got into politics he wasn't even a millionaire yet well, he he was an inheritance baby, right? So he got because his dad yeah. was was born into wealth, and then uh, yeah, uh, he would have been he would have been through inheritance because I mean Pierre was certainly a millionaire. Yeah, 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 but yeah. but not not personally, I guess for, yeah. for his own making. Either way, either money. way, you guys are you're both right. I mean, yeah, his yeah. wealth now is just infinitely more than it was even well, even from the point in which he became prime minister. It's it's yeah, just crazy. absolutely. Yeah diametrically opposed to the Canadian people. He's done exactly as well as we haven't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's almost like he's taking it right out of our pockets. Yeah, almost. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Almost. But, you know, that'd be a conspiracy theory. Well, here's another thing, too, right? Like, if you... 
the 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 level see if you actually wanted a serious corruption anti-corruption movement they're they're always trying to like do this stuff against china against russia where you have countries that are actually doing more successful battle against their deep states look i mean just look at the biden you know crime family the whole freaking biden crime family is up to their eyeballs in all sorts of graft bioweapons contracts like barissimo holding stuff prostitutes galore from like the ex-mayor of moscow's wife bringing in prostitutes to hunter and all sorts of things and you know then you have with justin you have stephen bronfman the 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 heir to the bronfman dynasty who is like one of the top handlers of the new liberal party of canada 2020 fame that's this a guy, canada like, dry right seagram seagrams yeah i mean yeah. The, the bronfman family owns seagrams they were the ones who like oversaw the um pro like they came to their their giant fortunes and, and wealth during prohibition um yeah, the entire drug narcotics operation of bringing in <laughs> drugs from asia was all brought in through these guys that interface with Marilansky and the, uh, the southern branch of the of the of the mafia yeah. both jewish corsican sicilian mafias that were all interfacing with the bronfmans uh high level super high level and and they're still in charge of the mass delegal like the mass legalization of drugs that's just now i mean we're seeing this thing just like you know go full this is this is through young bronfman now yeah yes yeah, wow bronfman. yeah Jeez. man yeah like close buddies of of justin uh of you course. know got in on the ground floor buying massive shares of like the former Sh hershey's factory back in 2012 right in time when it could be retooled to become the uh the new weed growing factory of of ontario like the right. biggest like you know industrial production weed weed factory and uh, now they're expanding it obviously also into psychedelics and other things that they want to also normalize fentanyl they want to like you know make this more accessible to everybody who just needs it to reduce their pain and blah 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 ignoring the fact that they're in pain because their government is trying to kill them and has like destroyed the economy <laughs> like but so, we're getting ready for the new economy because we're bringing in uh cartel members by the thousands now and we're going to have the same fentanyl issues that they're having in like san francisco and the big yeah. cities in the states mm. where they're just helplessly run by the cartels the cartels openly bring in the drugs they run like the the guy selling you the fentanyl on the street doesn't even work for himself anymore it doesn't even work for people who are making the it's all coming in from mexico or from the south there's a great guy on youtube if the name comes to me i'll put a link up for him uh he's just like this i i think maybe he tried to have a hip-hop career or something but he's super kind of like white like hip-hop oh anonymous uh, uh, uh not anonymous you know, you know the guy and he, he goes into the cities and just hits the streets and finds and hits and talks to the hardest people and the the yeah, filthiest yeah. people and gets the truth you know and then so the, they're like where do the drugs come from and he goes and finds him and he goes and talks to two of the top dudes i think the last one i saw i think was san francisco and it, the, the deadly mofos with strapped guns all over them and, and stuff Whoa. And they're just like, yeah, it's the cartels. The cartels tell us, they, they deliver it to us. They tell us the price down to the penny, what we're selling it for. Um, and uh, the, all the people they're streaming, for not all the people, but the people that I don't want to pull a Trump, not all the people streaming, but, but there's a whole stream within the stream of these immigrants that are fully just part of this infrastructure to and, and get the drugs get in and the the lieutenants get in and the and the corporals and all the way down and they're they're running these cities which through you know liberal policies are just turning the other cheek and letting it go right so i mean the hope of combating this is gone so maybe this is the new economy and trudeau's got got good investment advice from the friggin bronfman's what <laughs> oh my yeah. god it never ends matt it yeah. never ends. It hurts the brain to have you on. I should have taken a Tylenol before you got on. <laughs> Damn, man. Um, yeah. So uh, let, let's let's flip over to the film because we're here for the film premiere, the broadcast oh, yeah. world premiere of the film because we're at, uh, you know, 40 some minutes already. Um, yeah. How'd this one go? This one was a bit of an adventure for anyone tuning in that doesn't know. I edit the, the films and kind of like work with Matt and Cynthia at Canadian Patriot Press to put these films together from from their scripts. So that's why that's why there's an interplay there. I just wanted to fill people in if they didn't yeah. know that. 
Yeah, and you do so much more than edit, Jason. I mean, you're you're very humble, but I mean, you're 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 wearing a lot of hats at the same time. Um, and your artistic insight, your is, is vital to making these things become the what I what I'm now realizing are real like art pieces as well as weapons in the the war against this oligarchical, you know, machinery. Artistic uh, weapons, I love it. Yeah, so we landed on on director on on the new one. Director. Uh, no. mixed, yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. I, it, I think that was a good. That's a good, appropriate thing. Um, yeah, like a TV like, director, not like Steven Spielberg or anything. But yeah, no, like, it was good. You know, uh, like a director. I got. I got to put together the scenes and make it happen from a script. I'm. I'm a director. Yeah, exactly. You're a director. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. clearly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so all that to say, the um, I think that each one is just getting better. Um, it, it's just honing and tuning and tuning uh, more and more, and and so this is a second episode of an ongoing series I, at first i thought it was going to be maybe three or four right first i thought it was going to be one video we tried to make one didn't work uh out it didn't hit appropriately in, in terms of you know trying to do in 25 minutes all of these big things we want to get across all these big messages about what the hell is going on with the ufo disclosure stuff it, we're getting it full spectrum mainstream media you name it it's in the it's in the it's in Hollywood. It's in books. It's in print. Everything is. And we made a whole first episode. We made the the whole first thing. We were done, and and it was like a thirty some minutes or something, and yeah. got all the way to the finished state. So again, like, you know, like a month of working, and then went like, mm, you know what? <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> not it just quite doesn't... working. And, yeah. and and it's a good thing that we did because this second one is now officially the longest film we've ever made. Fifty three minutes or something like that. Yeah. So and that's just part two, and we tried to do it in one video. So yeah, we were way too ambitious. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this is. Uh, I, I'm not at this point going to be foolish enough to put a, a number on how many episodes this is going to turn out to be. We're effectively, we we you know we realize that what we're doing is not just dealing with the Lawrence Rockefeller CIA role in cultivating the the UFO psyop over the course of of the last eighty years. We're we're dealing with so much more than that which can only be properly approached by looking at the revival of a pagan mystery cult and the mass initiation ceremony that's that's being attempted and i i, I don't want to use the word too loosely but there is a mass initiation effort that you that is based upon the attempt to bring back something that was very bad before the Christ, before christianity was brought into this world in the west especially in, in the west whereby you had a very controlled system of global controls based on superstitious uh, populations believing in a, in, a, in, a, in a multiplicity of pagan deities with very elaborate creation stories, sacred myths that were controlled by a technocratic priesthood of higher initiates that would rise through the ranks of initiation to become the esoteric elite of the ancient world that would manage wars, that would manage banking, that would manage all of the the manipulations that we can read about from uh, Herodotus, you know, the different wars of uh, Persia versus Athens, the, the different battles, um, you know, uh, the, the rise of Persia, what Babylon was doing before that. We get a sense of that from some of the surviving historical accounts, what, what's often missed. Although it's still there if you're looking for it. You can find it in Herodotus, you can find it in Aeschylus, you can find it in Plato, in Cicero, in Augustine, is the role of the cult of Mithra, the cult of Eleusis, the cults of Magna Mater, the cult of Demeter, um, which is part of uh, Eleusis, the Eleusinian mysteries, uh, the cult of Marduk, the cult of Apollo. And these different cults were essentially the same thing with different names branded to accommodate local profiled populations that had certain you know, different tastes. You wouldn't you wouldn't market Coca Cola the same way in Kenya as you would in Russia as you would in Africa, but it's still Coca Cola, right? It might just be called something a little bit different in Kenya or Africa, but it's still the same garbage. Um, so that <laughs> that's essentially how this international network of mystery cults operated. Um, monotheism became very disruptive, especially the idea of of a, of a singular, um, reasonable, loving God as a concept. That organized society around that that found its its in the West at least its most strong representation first in Judaism and then in um, in Christianity and it became very um, incompatible with the pagan structures of the mystery cults and so there's been an, a two thousand year obsession 
to revive that old um, that old school system of controls. And uh, and so that was sort of episode one that Cynthia wrote. Cynthia and I both wrote episode two as well. Um, to, to episode one was to sort of get across that historical scope and then and then tying in the issue of, well, what is the occult underground? What is Rosicrucianism at, as far as a, having a direct continuity to the ancient mystery cults of Rome and Babylon and how they became or created certain pseudo-Christian Gnostic movements in the second, third, fourth century, right, that sort of took on a Christian veneer, but were actually working to destroy Christianity from within. A lot of them were Neoplatonic uh, hermetic orders um, operating through the Library of Alexandria, as I'm coming to discover <laughs> increasingly. My whole idea of like what the hell the, the shutdown of the Library of Alexandria was all about is actually changing as I'm looking at things from the standpoint. Um, maybe, maybe might not have been totally a bad thing. I'm just saying that. <laughs> no, 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 not completely. Um, but that's where my mind is sort of like entertaining this right now. There's a video that keeps coming up in my YouTube recommends that it, the headline hints that the the burning of the Library of Alexandria isn't what we thought it was. And so I, I'm going to go watch that tonight after this because I've been kind of putting it off. So mm. that's that's very interesting. And so of course all these guys, all these kind of like. Uh, rich exclusive eugenicists you know uh, edge of darwin times in england they're all steeped in this stuff already to some degree and they seem to be motivated to create their own version of it for a new time for, with futuristic uh modern slick with uh seems like they're trying to replace the basis of that humanity had been using for hundreds, if not thousands of years, a religious based, community based, and that they seem to be striking out to take, to transplant their system underneath it. And, and aliens seem to be a really good way to kind of insert that. Well, am I, am I doing a decent wrap up of it? Yeah, that's, the, that's, but I would add one element to it is that the cultural, uh, condition that they 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 need to make this all work is this is the is the separation of the mental divide that allows us to judge the difference between reality and fiction and dream and waking so they're they have to break down those those walls that differentiate those two states and allow us to discern um, and use judgment about reality and discern it as something different from um, a sleep, a fantasy, an illusion, um, a hallucinogenic sort of dream. That they, that needs to go. And so, the what H.G. Wells brought online with the Fabian Society and and what we we go through in this episode too uh, plays right into that important creation. Like what what was science fiction designed to do, and how did H.G. Wells is intentions ideas as this misanthropic student of thomas huxley how did how did this shape and pervert so much of the next 120 years after 1900 of of our world um yeah and, and with with that then we can understand as, as as a bit of a scaffolding everything else that happened after world war ii was as the whole flying saucer you know, stuff became more and more impressed into our collective psyche. Mm -hmm. and these various, and we're eventually going to get get into this in future episodes. How uh, Carl Jung worked with Alan Dulles as part of the top down psychologists that were organizing the um, this no, whole. Not crew. Alan Dulles. Not Dulles again. Oh God, I can't. <laughs> oh, take he's it. all over this thing. Oh, he's that. all over everything, man. Yeah. I've I, I've had to go out and find so many pictures of Alan Dulles making these films for you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's in everything. God damn, what a what a true bastard. Yeah, really. So, uh, shall we fire her up? We'll watch. Um, you know, maybe the starting quarter or so. Come back for finishing thoughts and and thoughts uh, on episode three as well, which will be yeah. coming yeah, up good. eventually. Sure. All right. So I will leave our mics on in case anyone wants to shout out and like elucidate something or anything's going on. Just uh, mute them locally while it's playing so we don't get any strange feedbacks. All right, everyone. Here we go. The Hidden Hand Behind UFOs Part 2. 
world premiere. Let's get it. Are they out there? Or are we being used? Why now? Uh, there's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. Disclosure. Formed in the course of my official duties of a multi-decade uh, UAP crash retrieval and reverse engineering programs or PSYOP. Very high level that, that uh, closed the door, looked me in the eye and says, okay, I'm gonna introduce you to somebody. What is the agenda? Protect the higher echelon against detection. They can serve as a means of effecting communication. A war of the worlds? Or a war for your mind? Join the search for the truth. The ability to discern reality from fantasy is an absolute precondition for survival. But lately, this discernment has become much more difficult than it used to be for millions of people in America and beyond. And why not? Extraterrestrials have transformed from the stuff of science fiction into hard fact, supported by congressional testimonies of Pentagon whistleblowers, leading figures in American intelligence services, and elected officials. In from what you know, uh, are they all the same or we got different kinds of them? George, there's at least 70 different species and probably more. Offering new and robust data acquisition methods into UAPs. They keep telling us they don't exist, but they block every opportunity for us to get a hold of the information. Were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. We are told to prepare for government disclosure of alien contact at any moment. The transdimensional interstellar technology will benefit humanity. And even the CIA has released reports claiming to have captured nine UFOs since 2003 alone. But is any of this true? Or is our perception of reality being blurred by design? by political forces that wish to reset not only humanity's economic systems, but entire value systems, in order to bring about a new set of sacred beliefs about mankind's origins and purposes, guided by a new technocratic priesthood. To explore this important question in greater detail, we will go back in time, skipping over decades, across the assassinations of presidents, the creation of a military-industrial complex, wars in Indochina, and even before a war with Nazi Germany, to a man named H.G. Wells and his call for world government. Although popularly known as a writer of science fiction, H.G. Wells' tireless efforts to propagandize for the cause of world government provides us a master key into understanding his role shaping world politics and even in understanding the true purposes of his science fiction works. In fact, the term New World Order itself was coined by H.G. Wells in his 1940 book outlining a plan for coordinating a new regime of global control 
with the intention of replacing the outdated structures of nation-states with a system of collectivization managed by a high priest class of scientific engineers. In his new world order, Wells was explicit. It is the system of nationalist individualism that has to go. We are living in the end of the sovereign states. In the great struggle to evoke a westernized world socialism, contemporary governments may vanish. Countless people will hate the new world order and will die protesting it. Wells was not merely a political theorist speaking in a vacuum, but as chair of the League of Free Nations Association in January 1919, Wells published the idea of a League of Nations, which promoted the League as the basis of his new world order. Additionally, Wells's Declaration of the Rights of Man, published in 1940, did in fact become the basis for the later UN Declaration of the same name in 1948. Thus, we should ask the question, were Wells's fictional works separate from the political ambitions to which he was devoted? Not at all. In his fictional work, Shape of Things to Come, published in 1933, H.G. Wells writes of the future, predicting rather optimistically that there will be another world war in just a few years, followed by epidemics and famine. In this fictional future, war continues for 30 years into the 1960s, despite the people having forgotten why they started fighting. Humanity enters a new dark age. In a last bid for victory, the enemy deploys a biological weapon resulting in the wandering sickness, producing the first zombies ever shown in popular entertainment. By 1970, Wells describes how the global population has dropped to a little under one billion. Although this is depicted as horrific, it is at the same time depicted as a necessity, a great reset to restore the balance, so to speak. It is only with this reduced population size that the world can begin to build back better out of the chaos. A world of failed nation states is replaced with a new phase of evolution as a biologically superior species emerges, with the inferior having been culled by war and disease. This new transhuman species is managed by a bureaucratic system under the form of a world government. This theme is repeated again in his earlier work, The World Set Free, published in 1914, where Wells predicts the atomic bomb, which, though monstrous, is again a necessity to allow humanity to reset and enter into a more civilized, more evolved species, a utopia organized yet again under a world government. In The World Set Free, Wells writes, The catastrophe of the atomic bombs which shook men, shook them out of their old established habits of thought, and out of the lightly held beliefs and prejudices that came down to them from the past. Men were made nascent. They were released from old ties. For good or evil, they were ready for new associations. The equilibrium could be restored only by civilization destroying itself down to a level at which modern apparatus could no longer be produced, or by human nature adapting itself and its institutions to the new conditions. It was for the latter alternative that the assembly existed. This is also how Aldous Huxley starts his Utopia for a Brave New World, which portrayed a future inspired largely by Wells's vision. Huxley writes that his Wellsian-inspired Utopia could only have come about after the Nine Years' War, the Great Economic Collapse, where there was only a choice between world control and destruction. Throughout Wells's stories, anyone supporting national sovereignty were showcased as simply ignorant militarists who were ultimately forced to submit to the greater wisdom of Masonic high priests of global government. We're scouting this region now to see how things are. You found out this is an independent sovereign state. Yes, we must talk about that. We don't discuss it. 
We don't approve of independent sovereign states. You don't approve? We mean to stop them. That's war, if you will. Well, I think we know how we stand. The concept of human nature itself is consistently featured as a mixture of corruption, selfishness, and self-delusion animated by folly and Darwinian forces of survival of the fittest in a race of each against all. In the time machine, civilization has long been destroyed as humanity has evolved into two separate species, one being monstrous Morlocks, the heirs to the laboring classes, and the other being simple-minded Aryan Eloi, the offspring of the oligarchical families, who serve as food for those underworld creatures that are the genetic heirs of the 20th century working class. In the 1914 novel, The World Set Free, new breakthroughs in atomic science usher in horrific doomsday weapons destroying most of humanity with visceral descriptions of millions slaughtered by nuclear fire and years of nuclear winter. This book was written 30 years before the actual creation of an atomic bomb, and as we will come to see, directly guided the minds of those who founded the Manhattan Project which in turn manifested on Earth Wells' 1914 vision during World War II. The self-induced slaughter of humanity is of course solved with the eventual creation of a world government made up of genetically modified superior humans and new world religion guided by a visionary leader whom Wells named Marcus Karenin. Wells describes Karenin's view of the new religion. He saw religion without hallucinations, without superstitious reverence, as a common thing, as necessary as food and air. He saw that indeed it had already percolated away from the temples and hierarchies and symbols in which men had sought to imprison it, that it was already at work anonymously and obscurely in the universal acceptance of the greater state. He gave it clearer expression, rephrased it to the lights and perspectives of the new dawn. H.G. Wells was not the first imperialist to recognize the value of terror of the unknown as a useful tool in controlling the masses, but he was the first to give this external terror the form of extraterrestrial invaders from outer space. In The War of the Worlds, published in 1898, these invaders from Mars descended upon an unwitting humanity with the intention of mass extermination and enslavement of the survivors, utilizing death rays and poisonous gas. The aliens featured in Wells' stories were akin to gods, beyond the power of mankind to affect in any way, and omnipotent in their capacity for destruction and manipulation of the insignificant lives of the masses. Or, to be more specific, the aliens were portrayed as a way to cull the human population of its most weak, of its most unfit to survive. In the house of the Lord. Wells described the aliens in War of the Worlds as a more evolved species of human, but likely with a common origin. Thus the aliens were largely to be viewed as our future more evolved and efficient selves, removed of organic fluctuations of mood and emotion. Wells would consistently stress the evolution of large heads with very small bodies. Strange as it may seem to a human being, all the complex apparatus of digestion which makes up the bulk of our bodies did not exist in the Martians. They were heads, merely heads, entrails, they had none. They did not eat, much less digest. Instead, they took the fresh living blood of other creatures, including humans, and injected it into their own veins. To me, it is quite credible that the Martians may be descended from beings not unlike ourselves. We men, 
are just in the beginning of the evolution that the Martians have worked out. They have become practically mere brains, wearing different bodies according to their needs, just as men wear suits of clothes. When the aliens fail to take over the Earth in the War of the Worlds, it is not due to human innovation or bravery, but the mere chance of an Earth-based germ from which the invaders from Mars had no immunity, resulting in their death. Describing the wreckage of the dead aliens, Wells writes, Scattered about it, some in their overturned war machines, some in the now rigid handling machines, and a dozen of them stark and silent and laid in a row, were the Martians, dead, slain by the putrefactive and diseased bacteria against which their systems were unprepared. Thus, ironically, it was the backwardness of the humans who had not yet found a way to eliminate all germs and disease as the aliens had that resulted in only a temporary defeat of the invaders. To comprehend why Wells devoted himself to stories that portrayed bleak dystopias. And that's all you get. You got to go see the real thing. Your mm -hmm. mic on there, Matt? You're good? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's on there. Okay. Cool. Voila. QR code up to go watch it on Evil YouTube. You got it on uh, Rumble or BitChute or uh, Odyssey or something too? or I made the QR code just while we were watching that for the uh, YouTube one. Ah, okay. Yeah. Takes a second to make these things. Uh, it's incredible though. Restream lets you do this on the fly and get a mm. screenshot of the thing and paste in the, the URL and it makes the QR code. Pretty awesome. But yeah, I didn't have time to hunt down the, the Rumbles and stuff like that. Uh, a better host would have been prepared. I'm sorry, Matt. <laughs> no, dude, that was a uh, no. I think that was a that was a nice a nice teaser. You just lifted the uh, lifted the, the 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 pants just enough. Um, people want to no. This is a terrible line of of metaphor that I'm using right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, but dude, honestly, like I I do hope that people who are watching uh, will watch the whole thing. It's it's about to shift gears and and dive deeply into the political tool, not scientist, that was Charles Darwin and the entire X Club under Huxley, T Thomas, that managed Charles Darwin and Darwin, the Darwinistic interpretation of evolution. It's bonkers. Which, it's it's bonkers. bonkers. We're yeah. about to get into uh, the X Club, Fabian Society, all these groups that, that they, they try to tell us it's just a conspiracy <coughs> theory. Yeah. You're just a hopeless conspiracy theorist when these guys are openly conspiring. It, yes. It's, <laughs> right? It goes back to like our first video, which was about conspiracy theories. And mm -hmm. like conspiracy is actually the major moving force of global politics. Yeah. And then, yet we, we get made fun of for our conspiracy theories. Um, I wanted to get a review from a citizen. Look who we got. Hey, Mike. <laughs> you know, it, it'll be more than just me. Just stand by. I'm uh -oh. sure my, do my, my daughters will be in done. shortly. The whole the whole clan would have loved to have been here because we absolutely were enthralled with the video. So there's going to be lots of love to say about this. Uh, <laughs> definitely uh, hats off and, uh, and a salute to to the whole process for, for Jay, uh, Cynthia. It was so good. It was like so good. I think it disturbed Macy, but it was it was so good. <laughs> Macy, all right? It did disturb me. I'm not gonna lie. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like my no. dad comes over at me. He's like, "Are you feeling a little black pilled?" I'm like, "A little." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, elaborate. What uh, when, what was hitting you? Well, uh, it's just seeing how interconnected all these people are, and then at one point you're just like thinking about it, and you're like. Okay, these are actual people that are really ideologically obsessed. Like that's that's unfortunate. Like just how manipulative we can get just by thinking that we control things and um, 
that we have to control things and that that was just I didn't like that part at all. And I think that it's interesting because in the first episode, we're kind of talking about like the the mystery religions. And I was, my question to Matt was a bit like, there's almost like the center high hierarchy in terms of these people that actually understand what's going on. Did they study almost like the works of the cult of Delphi in order to have this sort of knowledge of how to manipulate nations and all that? Yeah, I, I think it this sort of it's not so much that I think that they studied the cult of Delphi as much as they are the, the cult of Delphi. Like it's like <laughs> it's this unbroken direct continuity of tradition. Although I, I've noticed that in 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 pulling a lot of this stuff up because it the, the big question that a lot of people have when they start scratching on conspiracy theories and they start like readjusting their minds to start re reevaluating re their reality and their past, according to this new insight that there have been these conspiracies right. shaping things from above that are typically ignored in a lot of our textbooks mm -hmm. and like acceptable narratives is that uh, it gets weird fast. Um <laughs> And, um, you know, you, it doesn't take long before you start bumping in again and again to like a Masonic group here behind the FBI and this Masonic group there and, and this, you know, hermetic order of the Golden Dawn there and these Rosicrucians there. And, oh, yeah, all of the British Royal Society was founded by Rosicrucians. Well, what the hell is that? So you're like, the, the, the difficult thing that I've noticed is, uh, is you're now entering a realm that requires the mind um, shift gears a little bit. And the question is, do they actually have mystical power? Is there really a, a, a set of secrets known to the inner elites who are initiates in these different mystery schools that channel messages from spirit beings from the from the beyond, uh, you know, and and whatever else, you know, Blavatsky, Madame Blavatsky from the Theosophist is channeling messages from hidden masters of the Great White Lodge, which, you know. That's that's at least her messaging that's making her popular, and and there you know you got these these various special people who are conducting seances as sort of modern oracles. Um, they're they're doing little like little you know numerological um, readings of that involve astronaut or uh, 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 astrology charts and other things, and they're they're making forecasts and and they're make and it and it's not just like quirky or a super super. It's not only um, uh a superstitious fad it's shaping wars it's like kings and leaders and generals are being advised by are going and seeking counsel to these oracles right and then we see it in our modern age i, I mean the fact that edgar hoover was a high initiate of the the southern right so the, the question is do these characters have special powers of creatures of the beyond that give them an ability to maintain dominance over the masses of the earth largely at most people's expenses um or or is it um an illusion like are they using um trickery and so in my assessment um which was facilitated which was assisted by my 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 reading of people who who pioneered a lot of this type of research like friedrich schiller um, who did a lot of this this work on the occult and the methods of the occult in inducing target uh, people to destroy themselves? Um, Schiller was a was a 18th century poet. I know you guys have have looked into him. Uh, Cynthia did some amazing deep dives, which really blew my mind on what Schiller was actually doing in a lot of his stories to expose this thing and their techniques. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe also exposed a lot of these these illusionist tricks in his uh, in. Ver a variety of his short stories on the chess player, the robotic chess player that was people were told is like this spirit chess chess machine that's that's able to beat you in the 18, 1830s. Um, as it was discovered, it was just like a little remote control device and a, and a, and a small midget who was uh, manipulating it. Um, I knew it. it. It's the midgets. Yeah. It's always <laughs> been the midget. <laughs> <laughs> Houdini. Houdini, actually. Um, surprise, surprise, was actually... A major nemesis of these theosophists and uh, leaders of the, the the Society for Psychical Research, 
Um, yeah, rumor has it they actually murdered his ass in one of his last magic tricks. If I'm not mistaken, I did do some reading upon this, and that was actually why one of his last tricks failed because he had an assistant that got bought, and that's why he failed on one of his last tricks because he needed to ice his ass because he was actually willing to expose the shadow casters. Yeah, I, I'm I'm on that that same trail as you are, and and he was actually integral in for 20 years exposing all of these fake seances, the fake channelers, just showcasing how they were using a variety of trickery to uh, to to dupe people into believing that they were speaking to their deceased son or husband who died in World War One. A lot of people were grieving. Um, so there was a lot of susceptible people and, and Houdini was just exploding all of these illusionist tricks and was master. And, and this was huge at the time that, that, that this whole spiritualist movement was. Oh yeah. Dry gigantic and all these assholes were were into it at least pro, uh were proponents of it yeah and he actually passed uh legislation in 1925 in congress houdini was spearheading the passage of legislation in congress that made it illegal to uh defraud people as uh, as a as a channeler in america you couldn't do that so that was the same that was a, a couple of months before he died and uh, yeah, there's a lot of fishy stuff about his death. Who was the the guy doing the autopsy? They say it happened in Montreal, where they they say you know some guy he asked some some young punk to punch him in the stomach, and he wasn't ready for it, and it burst his appendix, and then he. Died. That's the story I heard. Yeah, it, it, right down to a movie okay. I saw when I was like 11. Uh, there was a big movie came out about Houdini, and that's how they did it. Yeah, it was just like. A, uh, I want to do the punch thing, and he's like, "Okay, oh," and he and he surprises him with a punch, and that's the big story <laughs> that we've all been given. Yeah, I've been uh, physically assaulted several times in my life, and I don't think it works that way. He'll, <laughs> nah. he'll yeah, yeah, it's, uh, and and Houdini was a beast. He was a monster. You see pictures of him with his shirt off, and he, he's on the edge of like steroids. The guy is so built. So I mean that he got killed by like one punch. <laughs> no. <laughs> No yeah. Yeah. yeah, it smells. Yeah. It's so, so that's so like maybe it was Bruce uh, Lee. Bruce Lee punched him. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, though, though. One punch, one punch. Pow. And and hey, so I got a question. Who inspired the reading voice of H. G. Wells in the doc in its documentary? That was that was off the cuff. That just kind of worked out because uh, I my my plan when I was when I was like reading the script. Um, I had always thought that we were going to use, we were going to like try to talent search and find some like creepy British, somebody who could do a creepy <laughs> British voice or use like some, some AI voice or something. So I, I was just kind of like, just which we've mostly people. done before. We've yeah. mostly done that before, but I think we had a good pivot moment during this. So uh, you put like really solid effort into it. And I think, hmm. You doing the the creepy British voices was only bothering you. It was you, Matt. It was you. Oh yeah, yeah. I yeah, knew it. I him. knew it. I was yeah. like, oh man, the tones. That it was the tones, and then the way you read. Because whenever whenever you're ad libbing, like I've watched like hundreds of hours of your work. So whenever you're ad libbing and you're in your inspirational state versus when you have to follow a script, there's an entirely different. Uh, uh, energy and vocation yeah. tone that arises. So as I was listening to it, I was like, this has got to be Matt with voice augmentation. It just has to be to a degree because there was certain, certain tones. That's awesome. Yeah. I, yeah. I, that yeah, is so, awesome. So we got past a certain post. Good for you, man. Where, that is where, wicked. Yeah, where we were always doing this. And then Matt was like, can we get rid of my stupid impersonation? Yeah, let, let's get rid of that. Like, I don't know about this. And then I think it, Cynthia was giving feedback at, at one point. And she well, was you, like, you and, and Cynthia she, she were was, both... She was just like, this is great. Like, just leave this. Yeah, and well, both, like, both yes, you and Cynthia yes, were like, why great. are you guys... Yeah, you're like, well, why don't you just <laughs> it? And yeah. I was the only one who was out of the loop. And I just thought it was it was just... You well, know, yeah, brilliant. You know, on your end, you're, you're just farting around. And you're doing, you know, five or six different people throughout yeah. it but it, it doesn't matter you know it, it, it's great it works good performance so so that we, we got over a post there so we can continue to do that to some degree we used ai for the one vern vernon guy vernon the at the yeah. vernon gibson yeah we used it for him um right but uh boy it's ironic making these videos about evil transhumanists but i'm increasingly pulling 
artificial intelligence into these productions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ironically, eh? yeah, yeah, you some... know, they, Yo, it's being there. used a lot. We've got a voice there. Yeah. We've used voice all the time. The imagery is is really, of course, that's what I'm, that's what we're starved for. We get these brilliant scripts, but then it's like, what the hell am I going to show? Um, and the, the big evolution was the first part of this series, the UFO ones, where hmm. so we've got to come up with Greek gods and and all this stuff. So, I mean, AI has just been incredible for that. Um, yeah, we did a double recap just to just to get the context. Right? So we watched the first one again, and then we walked into the second one right after, and it was like, it, it was brilliant. I mean, like... Fantastic. How do, yeah, they, no, they, just they, loving it. Do they feel like they flow together? Yes. Yeah, In good. my opinion... The answer to that is an emphatic yes. Good, good, because on our side, it's you know, it's months in between them, so it's kind of like, are we keeping? Feels like labor? years. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Tell me about it. Um, but yeah, we're increasingly bringing in AI. But I mean, I don't know. What are you going to do, right? Like the, this stuff is. It, the, 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 I hear you know everyone's scared. What's AI going to do? It's obviously going to wipe out entire sectors of industry. Obviously, um, but. You know, I, I always throw back to the turn of the previous century. There were ice moguls. There were Elon Musks of ice who fought over uh, land leases on like Lake Huron for to own acreages when it froze over to cut out perfect blocks of ice to then deliver to everyone. And they made the modern equivalent of billions of dollars uh, employed tens of thousands of people all over North America and Europe uh, to deliver ice for the ice boxes, the, the newfangled technology that kept your meat for three days, right? Um, and, uh, you know, then refrigeration came along and all of it ended in a blink, in a heartbeat, right. you know? So it's not necessarily evil in and of itself just because the technology takes over. It's just we have to be careful that it doesn't get the launch codes. <laughs> That's okay. It's racist now, according to Google or whatever that new program where oh they're, my they're like showing pictures of like the founding fathers of the United States and they were all black. They're all black. <laughs> like, Did you see any okay. of that, Matt? What? No. Oh, dude, it's go. It's it's going viral. <laughs> It's, yeah, I'll send you some it's links. Funny. They're like, yeah. uh, draw me uh, uh, five pictures of 1943 German soldiers, and they're all black. Yep. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I had I had this problem. We we in in um, the second part of Cynthia's series, uh, uh, escaping Calypso's Island oh, about the green. Is also brilliant. Thank you very yes. much. Um, the brilliance is Cynthia's. I am but a worm. The oh. the. But we were trying to like bring the myth to life through AI and it would just constantly lose the plot because I'd be like, um, you know, uh, uh, Ulysses and Calypso are standing on the island, you know, referencing the image that we already like and we got it. And it turns all the girls into black guys with beards and everybody's gay all of a sudden. <laughs> and, and, uh, and and I'm sitting there for like two hours just trying to, no, 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 no. The, 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 the Greek hero, Ulysses, who is a man. And, the, you know, the prompt is becoming like this long. Because I'm like, he is a Caucasian man or you're like a Greek white man. And he's standing with the Greek white woman, Calypso. And it would still bring back yeah. like two guys with beards kissing each other and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, not gay porn star, not that. It no, give you gay. Oh, porn yeah. Star. And it, yeah. It's, everything was <laughs> sexy and gay. And, and it's just yeah. like they, they baked it in here yeah, right from the start. So, you know, we faced that as a real problem because I think they're going to be leaning on AI increasingly to teach children and, and take oh, yeah, the schools. garbage in, garbage and, out. And, yeah, and it's going to be this stuff like, well, white people didn't do anything. Everybody's, you know, black and gay and crippled. And, and, the, the, and, and the, the AI, they're going to be asking these questions to. They're going to be asking questions to Wikipedia and AI, and they're going to be getting this back. Like, so fearful for schools in the future. Not that I wasn't already, but... <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah, we're getting, uh, I think we're at the limit of your time. Well, I was, was going to say, it's, it's sort of, no, I mean, this is an important topic. So I might yeah. scratch a little bit more on this, but, but yeah. this does sort of fall into HG Wells's world brain idea too, that sort of set the framework for cybernetics. Yes. And I think the whole thing with AI is 
like on the one hand, it's like a, like you just pointed out earlier with the the ice pick or the ice industry thing. It's it's like it's a tool, and and a tool could 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 hurt or create. Um, and if you if you have anything with information technology, it's like a very useful thing. It's great that we have computers and calculators, so it saves a ton of time. Super useful to have information tech and telecommunications, but it's you don't want to you don't want to give it a, a value it doesn't deserve within a process where it, everything has a natural place. You know, information technology has a natural place, and it grew out of like originally the efforts to have a, a an industrial space program in a pro-growth economy. That's where this stuff sort of got its its form um, in the 60s and the 70s was through having a mission for the future. And uh, and, and it's useful to support the, the aspirations of a society to grow and develop. But to make a whole economy based on information tech is where you go all wrong. You know, that's where things really go to hell. And it becomes more just the science of control and command by an elite that ultimately just don't want to be seen. I think a big chunk of AI is a way to create like another illusion for the masses to think, oh, see, computers are, are going to transcend evolution and do the thinking for us. So nobody, no individual, if people are duped by this, will be held accountable for mass atrocities <laughs> that someone would like to commit on humanity. Because it's like, well, it's the logical computer that's just so much more you know, intelligent than we are. And Wells, Wells would have loved that. Yeah. It's that, a great, that's the world brain. It's just like fantastic. Like yeah. I mean, the world brain is genius. It knows better. Uh, he says himself, the new world order is coming. Millions will die fighting it and they'll hate it. But yeah. So in case well, there are, there are right. Like uh, the, the what's coming is superior and that's all there is to it. And to, just to hit on your, your previous point about the 60s and 70s, Rain and I were just talking about this driving into Whitehorse the other day, where with all this 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 tax on tax on tax on tax on tax, and now now our government, even in Canada, is starting to talk about trillions in revenue. Where where are our where is our space adventure? Where where's our monorail? Where's our high-speed trains? Where is our new hydroelectric dams? Where is our our new nuclear program. Yeah. Where is anything? It's just nothing. Like you say, we're unleashing all this tech into a world that has no goals. Yeah, exactly. And then that's where I, I find it so useful to have this like top down global approach to, to like analysis because you compare how a lot of these same technologies are being deployed um, in, in China, for example, where they just completed one of the biggest dams in the world, hydroelectric dams. It's huge. It's like 350 meters high um, in, without any human input. Like, I mean, the thing itself is run by robotics that that built the entire thing. I mean, obviously, they needed some people, I guess, along the way to, to uh, manufacture some of the turbines or I don't even know. But the, but the way it's it's sold, and, and I mean, I've looked into it a little bit, is, is yeah, I mean, robots of a variety of types are all coordinated in a very intricate web of of interconnectivity organized and 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 uh, operated by an ai system that has a certain amount of like limited machine learning um no risk to humans and the thing was built in record time very effectively and it's going to now produce a massive amount of abundant electricity for for residential workers for for, re for people living in, in the region for an industry it's going to create flood control that's going to save tons of lives it's going to create a bounty of water to increase massive food production as well. And it's like, that is a breath of fresh air to just see so, like, what must be the philosophical worldview of behind the policy that applies AI in that kind of way versus the sick, you know, Wellsian misanthropic view of how this stuff has been applied in our world. Um, it's a breath of fresh air to have that contrast because otherwise people can get very black pilled and cynical about like they sure can it doesn't help when, when these guys are all like that they, they seem to be the the globalist view is yeah. just what you can't do yeah. you can't do this you can't eat that you can't go skidooing this weekend you yeah. can't do this you can't do that um and, and and instead as you just pointed out with projects such as that dam think of all we could do why don't they tell us what we can do? It's it's just what we can't do. 
You yeah, can't do this. We're talking about a culture that doesn't <clears throat> think the same way that we think in the West, though, too. Well, I mean, we have a tendency in the West to, uh, it's almost schizophrenic and it's short term. Mm. So, like, one of the things when the Tucker Carlson Putin interview was going on, and I started skimming because I, I try to pay attention to a lot of different cultural entities in the comment sections that are not just within North America, although our battles in Alberta, so don't get me wrong. We're all in in our battle for where we are at home. But I do try to keep open to the understanding that like there was several individuals out of Russia and even some members of Ukraine and Polish commentaries that were, were sitting back saying like, we, we, we talk the way Putin talks because stories and context is how we address our problems. And I found that just very, very interesting to hear that just from the regular, like, I'm just a pleb. They're just plebs. We comment. We're, we're sitting in the, the the presence of giants. Like, we look at Jason Dahls and Matthews and Cynthia's and, you know, all these other individuals that we're very much inspired by. So we look and we watch and Tom Luongo's, Alex Craner's, and it's like uh, 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 Joaquin Flores. You, you, you've got all these minds and they're, and they're trying to help Western minds kind of like think outside your damn borders because the world is a lot bigger than these artificial lines that the British empire put together hmm. to put you in your, in your little stable box. And, and the thing is, is that there are people they're thinking differently than we're thinking. And this is a bit of a problem because we are not, we're not running that empathy. We're not considering their story that got them there. That's why I thought Putin's, monologue for as long as it might have been in the beginning when he was trying to put Tucker in his place a little bit he's he's busy he's busy painting a tapestry of the culture from his perspective but it was long and then when you hear like people that come from that demographic on the other side of the the wall or the curtain or whatever it is that that Churchill set up for that the whole mess it's like they're sitting back going we think this way uh, I, I get the feeling I would have let, will Tucker go and do Xi Jinping? Because that would be an interview worth listening to as well. I was hoping that. Yeah. No, I, I think that um, in my assessment, Tucker, it's like, I, I, I liked Putin's little jab at the beginning of that interview uh, regarding, you know, how... Uh, <laughs> yes, how, the CIA jab? Yeah, the CIA, both yeah, the CIA yeah. pings. Oh my gosh, that was brilliant. Yeah, he's like, we know you. Uh, you, we, we've had a pr trouble with the CIA, and and I know you tried to join back when you were a young man, but you, luckily you didn't uh, get accepted. Right? Wink, wink. Um, I, I love how you could tell he fun. he read a good little folio on Carlson before he did the interview. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I got a sense that that Tucker does represent um, like, I, I, I don't see him as some people do as, as if he were um, a free agent who is like an honest broker necessarily of peace. Like, I think he does have, um, he is tied to intelligence, but I, I think he represents a slightly saner faction of the oligarchy that doesn't see their self-interest uh, being well-maintained by the current course of action into nuclear, uh, you know, Holocaust. So, um, you know, I think part of what he was doing there was partially to build bridges. And I, I think it's fantastic what the effect of, of that interview. But also, I think it was to, to feel out, one, is Putin and the, the people around Putin, are they susceptible to the type of um, mysticism that is required to... Because um, ultimately, one of, one of Tucker's mandates for the past few years has been the alien disclosure operation to prepare the groundwork of of the the psyche of the zeitgeist to accept the idea that they have to um believe in aliens uh, that have been around for since ancient history is, is what it's implied you know because if they're here now they they didn't just come here now it, it implies that you have to reevaluate your bible your quran how the pyramids were built in accordance with this knowledge that they've been here from other dimensions or other galaxies or whatever so that's part of what's in the broader context of this 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 whole thing the other thing was i think to, to map out so he asked putin you know do you believe in supernatural forces at work right now and putin was like putin's you know a worldly guy like he's, he's got a lot of experience and he's like no i i believe that all of the problems are being caused by humans <laughs> <Very clear laughs> yeah. on that. i've worked um, with russians they're very direct yeah yes 
And the other thing yes. was, uh, is there something that could cleave Russia away from China and back to a special U.S.-Russia relationship, which some some in the in the conservative groupings in America and believe that it's possible to go back 20 years when when Putin still wanted to or was open to joining NATO. And uh, and and, you know, people like John Mearsheimer is, is one of those people, one of those voices where they're like, you know, we, we should have not lost that opportunity. We got too arrogant telling Russia what to do and we should have brought them into NATO and, and we could now have a mutual resistance against China if we only did that then. So yeah. I think part of it was to feel out, is that possible? And there are some factions in Russia that would like that. Um, that's So I don't think we're gonna necessarily going to see Tucker interviewing Xi, because that's just not his assignment. No, no, I see Tucker uh, as actually a part of trying to move the sort of the, the religious ideological right into yeah. the anti-China, China bad. Like, it yeah. seems like no matter what, I mean, even in his latest interview that I just went over because he just put it out. Because there's this common theme of bringing someone in that has history with Maoist China or the Gang of Four. And it's like, okay, that's not this China. I understand that China. I've done some my own research in that and then also listening to tons of what I would consider trustworthy voices and it's like I, I see tucker as a part of the we're gonna bump we're gonna bias he bump it's gonna be a bump of the bias of individuals that have been pre-programmed through cold war rhetoric and we're gonna shift them into china's bad it's, it's a little more of a longer game than than the neocons that are just looking for war everywhere right now it's like no 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 we're eventually got to get to the point where we get enough of you supporting china bad uh, just just through bias not through thinking through Oh, well, it, it, it's been a bridge too far, the, the China thing. I mean, I, I, the, the, the massive irony, I spend a lot of time in Canadian freedom spaces on Twitter and such like that. The massive irony that all of these people three years ago thought that Putin was a bloodthirsty megalomaniac dictator that just, you know, killed his, his enemies with his bare hands uh, publicly um, now are practically cheering for the guy uh, won't apply any of that to China. When it comes to China, mainstream media, government, everything they say is absolutely correct. It's just the evil yellow horde. Mm. Uh, uh, it's wild. Yeah. Uh, when yeah. Matt, Matt, you I think watch Matt the news and you know that whatever they're telling you to believe is probably the opposite is true, but they won't apply it to China. Yeah. Madison? Yep. Get after it, Maddie. Oh, just <laughs> speaking of, you know, diverging the eye to somebody else you mentioned in part two of this the hidden hand of ufos how albert einstein was actually approached for the approval of the bomb and the excuse was that the germans were doing it and so we had to get, hop on their back after reading your science and shackles you know i have a little bit maybe of a biased um opinion towards albert einstein i went I wonder if he actually um, fell for that, or if he was a part of some other bigger ploy. What What is your take on that? Oh no, I, I I'm I'm sure he's a uh, a well intentioned guy with a with a sharp mind. I uh, I he was just in my in my view, he seems super naive, very na very politically naive. Um, he had a cynicism that I think was exploited um, by people like Bertrand Russell. And um, there's some really bad people who he just couldn't, he couldn't bring himself to identify what they were, um, who were always like working to control his perspectives from an early, from the pre-World War One period. But he, he was, th there was a reason why they didn't, they iced him out. So they didn't let him participate. They didn't want him involved in the Manhattan Project. Um but I, I've looked at, I followed his his bio pretty closely, and you know he was always working with people like Madame Curie. He was working with people like Paul Robeson during the uh, the post World War II battle against lynchings um, and the early civil rights movement. He was he was an, an honest guy, um, but so influential because his discoveries were were significant, although they were a bit confused. Um, one of the things, though, a, a lot of people who really don't like Einstein, they don't like a scarecrow. They, they, it's not. They're not talking about Einstein. They're talking about the 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 construction of Einstein that was popularized by Bertrand Russell, who interpreted Einstein for the scientific world, which was a very different 
construct than Einstein himself. And so there's a lot of like artificial stuff that, that believes in empty space, but, but a curved form of empty space, um, in, in the Bertrand Russell Einstein, a very hyper complexified thing. And, and, and Einstein was always pissed that people were, 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 um, believing in this lie that Russell and, and his collaborators repeated again and again saying that only three three or four people in the entire world understand Einstein's theory of, of relativity and they would try to like psychologically castrate people by saying it's just so complex you have to be a genius to even start thinking about it and and so don't even bother trying just just believe what experts say about Einstein and Einstein was always saying like look this is really not that complicated it, it's anybody can approach this um so he's he was always a little bit annoyed yeah, to kind of play off that, Arthur Fistenberg did a book about the invisible rainbow man's uh, history with electricity. Mm -hmm. And he was he had mentioned that for every time that we think like whatever we get sold on about, you know, who invented the radio, who invented the television, who invented, who invented. There was actually people that were well on their way to coming to these discoveries in different sections of the world right at the same time, because the minute that a gatekeeping idea broke through the 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 gates then a whole bunch of other people went oh it's possible and then they started to to dig in and grow and because well like brains as if you're going to actually clamp down our creative potential when somebody goes think about it think the thing about that's it. frustrating though about that is that they changed they put the parameters of the question of, in your mind of what you're supposed to be solving. So with the Manhattan Project, it's like you can only solve this specific problem and you can only solve this specific problem and you're not going to know anything about it. But because you have people that love to make discoveries, they're like, I would love to solve a problem. It's like, I know me. I probably would have been one of those people where they're like, oh my gosh, like you have to solve this problem. And I'm like, great let's go do it like <laughs> i would have been and i wouldn't have any idea as to what it was actually for and that's why it's tricky because it's like when we're even thinking of ai it's like garbage in and garbage out right so but the garbage in it's almost like now when i was watching it the reason why i felt a little bit like black pills because it's like you're not people aren't even understanding the ideas of how they got in their minds in the first place it's like they don't even know the borders that they're in. Like I was listening to you, Matt and Joaquin Flores, when you were talking about your Putin um, interview analysis. And it was like, well, can you explain why Hawaii is part of the United States? It's like one of those things where you're not understanding how this map came to be shaped in the first place. And that's why I was like, oh, that's horrible because, and at the same time though, it's a, it's a normal thing because people like my brains comprised of so many other different minds and brains and the questions that are in my head are actually a product of all of these all of my surroundings and these factors right so it's like this it's not necessarily always garbage in but there is always something that's interacting with you it's not just you so it's like then that comes to a mode of attention of like okay so what how would you like to choose to attend to something then knowing full well that you're influenced by your surroundings when people aren't even knowing full well that they're influenced by their surroundings because yeah. at least now i can make the choice <laughs> and also i think that the most important thing is when you're coming to a, a statement that's truthful the you are able to make that statement because you earned the interaction of the truth of it coming to you mm -hmm. and you coming to it to make this statement so it's like i think that a lot of people don't even when they're spewing what it is that they're saying, aren't actually in their own lived embodied experience, actually really paying attention to more than just what it is that they set their parameters to pay attention to. Oh, that's very well said. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I think that that's the, the whole fight, right? That That is embedded in all of this universal history is the effort on the one hand by people like Benjamin Franklin and, and, and those who really make discoveries and move society forward to help humanity discover how this God-given instrument is meant to work, which requires an element of discovery, self-discovery, which happens at the same time when you discover true, like when you, when you make discoveries of any amplitude that are legitimate, that have substance, it also requires going inward into your own mind and thinking about what your own mind was doing when you were negotiating that uh, that transformation of something you were ignorant of into a high knowledge of that thing, whatever it is. And it, it'll, it'll have a certain character 
that helps you discover more of who you are, what this higher attribute beyond the senses is that allows you to use your senses as if they were tools to get that that beautiful, it, joyful effect. And then you you have an increased power. There's more insight, right? Which 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 comes with that to make more discoveries, to build on a firmer foundation, to communicate more effectively. And so people like whether whether it's again St. Augustine or Ben Franklin or anybody who's really good, they're always like they're they're they've tapped into that understanding that humanity help themselves to use their mind. And on the inverse side, those who are creating counterfeit ideas that look like the truth, but when you scratch on it, you're like, no, that's a wind egg. It actually, it's it's designed as an illusionist trick to create a mannequin appearing like a human, but it's a mannequin, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and and when you start poking, you're like, oh wait, that's a fake, that's a decoy. <laughs> and, and it's, and that's, I think, one of the ways to smell out on a first degree approximation, like where are the real discoveries, who makes them and, and who are the counterfeiters who have like, like, you know, Leo uh, Zillard is brought up in that in that in that video. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that I knew that Z Zillard, who, who spearheaded the Manhattan Project, was a Wellsian. I didn't know to what degree until we start Cindy and I started like really researching it for the script. But one thing that shocked me is that when he was given the patents for uh, nuclear chain reactions, he never built a prototype. He never said how he discovered it. It was all very mystical. Um, and, and so you're like, okay, well, did anybody else discover nuclear chain reactions and say how they discovered them before, uh, before he did? And then you're like, oh shit. You scratch a little bit and you're like, oh yeah, Madame Curie's daughter, Mary Curie's Mary Curie's daughter, and her husband Pierre Joliet, who were this Nobel Prize winning dynamic duo couple of discoverers, discovered it before mm -hmm. Zillard. And for some reason, they they've been iced out of the story. Their method of in, of investigation has been obscured, and they created mm -hmm. the Wellesley mm -hmm. initiate to be the receiver of the praise of the discovery dis detached from the, the substance that was then patented and then given over to the secret science ministry of Britain and then the United States. And you're like, that's how this works. Um, so yeah, like what you just said is, is really important for people to hold their mind in. It, it, it's all about our subjective minds and being aware of how our minds work in a healthy state and how they can be induced to work in an unhealthy state appearing healthy. Right. It's not just broken. It's that it, it appears healthy, which makes it attractive as we walk into the trap. And that's sophistry. That's the whole art of sophistry is you create a construct that appears true, but it ain't. And you you, you detach yourself from any ability to use your mind when you're in that trap. You got to get out of it. And a lot of people just need a, need some creative prodding. <laughs> to... yeah, it's called left hemispheric philosophy. It's actually a philosophy of the left hemisphere. Wait till yeah. you get that sorted out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is something that I've been freaking out about, and I'm sitting on a personal video that I want to make about, um, you know, the 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 actual. This is an overused word, um, the the actual uh, gatekeeping that goes on within, you know, the sciences and stuff. There's um, people like this, Angela Collier, uh, Professor Dave. Three million subs. This guy blew up once he uh, took on flat earth, you know, for some low hanging fruit. Okay. But now he goes after uh, people like, um, I'm trying to remember this man's name, Canadian. Uh, he's got an extremely French name. I'm trying to see if his name is on here. Uh, and he's got a completely different model of, uh, say, like the sun, how the sun works. That's his big thing. He thinks the sun is a liquid. It's a very tied into, say, you know, electric universe and that kind of stuff. Hmm. And uh, our wonderful Professor Dave here, notice that his name is Professor Dave. Um, he does videos where he basically, as uh, pompously and insultingly as possible, goes after these people and calls them cranks, morons, idiots, like personally, horribly insulting. And he's at 3 million subs, right? And I think um, our Canadian guy, he's at 47,000 subs. So, you you know, you, this guy's in the ivory tower now. Um, I looked him up. Uh, he's a musician who dropped out 
of university twice. He has a degree in nothing. He's a professor of nothing. <laughs> He's a complete loser, and he makes fun of the, the our Canadian guy. I'm so I feel so bad. I hope he never sees this. Um, but super French name, like you know, uh, France Marie, like hyphenated de la France de Pierre or something like that. Um, he is a double PhD. And this little fucking twerp goes after him and calls him a crank because he he just doesn't like that this Canadian scientist has a different model of the sun than what yeah. he's been told is allowed. Yeah. And the same with this Angela Collier girl. Let me get her screen up. She's her biggest videos, uh, physics crackpots. Harvard and aliens, and she goes after uh, Avi Loeb, um, another double PhD and professor at Harvard in astrophysics, and she—that's she, the lead in her attack, and she is at two hundred thousand subs, but she's only been at it for a year, and and she's at it for um, three hundred thousand views on that. Uh, because Avi Loeb dared to suggest that uh, Oumuamua that came through the solar system a few years ago might be an alien craft, which is completely possible. There's no reason to think it's an alien craft, but there's no reason to think it's not. And these children get onto YouTube and they're part of the gatekeeping system that makes it as long as you stay within the boundaries, you know, this is what led to COVID and the lockdowns, this attitude that only we hold the truth. Uh, it has been destroying science for well over 100 years now. And it's one of my major uh, pet peeves and something I really want to do a big takedown video on someday because there's all sorts of other theories out there and other ways of, of looking at the data um, that need to, to stay in the conversation. You know, but like a, a, a dropout musician can get the voice and hold it because he's also made massive takedown videos on anti-vaxxers and uh and stuff like that where he just gets on and he drops in a little bit of data but mostly yeah. it's these people are assholes these people are killers well, these people are right-wing bigots it's the thomas isn't Huxley that method. DeLong? huh isn't that DeLong, the guy from blink or whatever like uh -huh. Same thing. This guy, this guy's right. a nobody. And how does he long? <laughs> like, I mean, like this. Uh, how, how about like read read the 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 physics works of Valentina Zarakova? Like, I've read tons of her papers. Like, this is someone who's actually figured out the cyclical nature of the sun. This is someone that sits back and actually presents evidence, and she had her papers removed. Well, it's After wild. presenting it, the evidence. Yes, it's absolutely it's, wild. And a deep dive into most of these theories from the sun to um, the Big Bang to everything. You, they, they themselves, the very gatekeepers that are holding the gates closed, in, plenty of times in their own works will say, you know, when you get right down to it, we don't really know. But it's, it's fine when they say it and they're talking to themselves. But if you dare to come up with any new theory that isn't their theory, their pet theory of the moment, then all the all the the forks and knives and insults, it gets personal. And I just hate that. I just can't stand that. Yeah. Well, you know, Matt, you watch a lot of these alternate theories as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was I was thinking about, you know, the method of of Thomas Huxley of bullying and ad hominems and and using like cynical sardonic humor to try to destroy uh, whatever rival you have who has a different opinion on science and that was Thomas Huxley's thing that that he didn't really typically um, engage in a platonic dialogue to see how how reason like which which hypothesis um, for or against Darwin's approach to evolution had had more concordance with with lawfulness with reasonability that is you know he didn't do any of that he he used ad hominem attacks he used berating hilarious humor uh he he destroyed his opponents very very similar to the techniques used by a lot of these these cut cutouts who you just pointed out who probably are getting funding from uh, from questionable organizations, I would say, if you scratch on that, and they probably also have teams. I mean, in a lot of these cases, you have teams of people who are packaging. They they have a target 
Um, it's like Navalny. Navalny would go in. He, Excellent. He, he revolutionized this thing called, um, what was it, shareholder um, revolution or something. I, I forgot the name. But it, but, but basically the, the idea was for him, he would he would buy minority shares of a variety of, of Russian companies so that it would grant him rights to go into the shareholder meetings with the boards of directors. And, uh, and then he would organize rebellion against the boards of directors from within the, the, the th and he would go in with these giant dossiers that were all supplied to him of all of the, um, the problems, the, the different discrepancies in the books and, and everything um, regarding these intricate companies that like Russ Atom and other big companies in order to destroy the company from within. And it's like, did he personally, this noob, you know, 30 something year old noob, uh, pull all of this elaborate material together to go in and make like a, a loud noise. Um, no, he obviously had teams of CIA and MI6 handlers whose job it is to dissect and look, look for all discrepancies. And then they made dossiers for him, probably with nice executive summaries and bullet points that he could memorize that would then be substantiated by these big, big files that he would then walk in and, and use as weapons to destabilize the government uh, from within. So I think that a lot of these these YouTube cutouts that especially flourished during COVID, but they're still flourishing on a variety of things. They're they're probably using a very similar model. Um, and people like Darwin, frankly, again, just because I said his name, um, they never let him speak in public. He never had to lecture. He never had to defend his his uh, views in public at any point. It was always a team of handlers who would do the dirty work. Um, and similar for. Yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll usually find a lot of these types of of figures who they create as a cutout that will be the, the, the new source of all of the discoveries that the oligarchy has stolen from real scientists. And they need to, like, if you can't mm. beat them, try to, like, repackage them, right? They, 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 will re, they will attribute them to, let's say, an Isaac Newton, who, who yeah. has, like, a weird god complex and yeah, yeah. is totally Kabbalistic and Gnostic and superstitious and doing alchemy and shit. And then they'll they'll create this 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 like hyper autistic character um who doesn't mind they have no they have they have they have no problem playing this game believing that they're like hot shit and uh and having teams like samuel clark and and there's a whole team of people um managing newton where he never has to go publicly and, and talk about or defend his theories he always has people controllers who are creating this this demigod image of newton Right, the demigod or Darwin, the demigod, or and this is going to come up in episode three of of our UFO series. Increasingly, as I'm realizing, I can't avoid it. <laughs> uh, Nikolai Tesla. Mm, yeah. mm. Oh man, I'm yeah, you were you, you were telling that, me I'm some excited. exciting stuff about Tesla. Some, some counter narrative. <laughs> some counter narrative coming up. Mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil it. Oh, but do it. <laughs> you gotta do it. Well, what I do want to say is, uh, just before we move away from the topic, your mm. immediately your mind immediately went to who are the groups behind these people, and to me that brought up immediately um, one of the biggest channels on YouTube for science, Veristasia. Probably everybody has seen this annoying asshole mm. on uh, on YouTube. Everyone seen this guy? Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, they, I no, well, a lot you're of mainstream lucky. YouTube. I go you're lucky. to the I go to the dark places of the forest to find my information. <laughs> <laughs> I spend plenty of time there, but I spend plenty of time here. And uh, I mean, I've been watching this guy for years, and he's he's so smug. Some some of his titles are like why all of you don't understand light or electricity. So for here, look, look, look what we've got here when I do. Uh, first off, I couldn't remember while we were talking the name of the channel, and it's Veristasium. So all I did was on YouTube, you can see at the top, I typed in science, and about the 10th video was from Veristasium. That's how big this guy is. And so I recently saw, and I was also trying to find this video in the background. I haven't found it yet. I came across a random Brit independent reporter who does a complete takedown of Veristasium. And you can see these two videos that I've got up here. Why the future of cars is electric. Why you should want driverless cars on roads now. He uncovers what only gets put in fine print in the video for 10 seconds. Completely bought and paid for by uh, electric 
taxi companies in San Francisco, big tech, uh -huh. completely bought and paid for. And uh, it went out. He compares about six different creators on YouTube that are have the same content, the same script, the same lines. And this is one of the science explainers, one of the biggest in the world. The guy is a billionaire off of this. And he, he comes out and he makes fun of people. Uh, he had a vaccine thing during COVID, um, the, the whole nine yards. So this asshole is controlling what people think about science. And nowhere in here, we've got the, the, the breakdown paragraph right here. Nowhere in there. Does it say that I was paid $17 million by electric car companies? You know, so so I just wanted to bring that up because, Matt, you hit that right away. Like, right away, you're like, okay, who's the organization behind them? <laughs> mm. yeah, yeah, it's always the same model. Yeah, no, it's a good yeah, – I would love to see you uh, make a, a little – a few videos even. Uh, I will. You, I've you got the, pro the project's named. I'm collecting footage. It's just, you know, it's on my oh. own time, so it'll happen when it happens. But it's just – it just increasingly infuriates me. The, not only the gatekeeping, but but the, the sheer – the vitriol, the anger, the the, the the demeanment of people that are trying to think yep. in new ways. It, it, uh, we can't let them win. What kind of society will we have if we let them win? Actually, look around. We're in the society. Uh, we're not going well, to win, but we're in it. <laughs> we, for a little while, we're at least still able to make and put out videos like this. We'll see. But we got to take responsibility. Build. Half of the reason we're in this society is that it's our fault. So Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to stand where I know I can stand and say, all right, fool me once. Yeah, yeah, shame on me. But from these days forward, it won't be that way. Even if it puts yep. me in a gulag with Matthew, Cynthia. Well, well, we'll share a gulag together. Although Cynthia will have to share it with my daughters because they'll separate males and females. But It's okay. I'm, we're making an escape plan, okay? We're not going to do what they did. I'm, I'm putting out guns a blazing. I'll give her my <laughs> rations. I know how to fast. <laughs> and when it's gulag time, I'll declare myself uh, identified female. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> All right, guys. I think uh, that's it's turned into a, a marathon. Yeah, Hell it was a show. It yeah. was appropriate. Yeah, you know, I always always love it when you guys pop in. This was uh, it added some nice fuel to the fires. It was great. Yeah, oh, you we, guys we, did so well, like so well. Honestly, I applaud, I applaud Jay what you did. It's true artistry, Matthew and Cynthia. Although she's not listening, but hopefully she'll watch or Matthew can pass it on. Just thank you so much for all of this this is once again just another layer of the battle that needs to happen and i know that you are one amongst many but our family is truly indebted and honored truly to actually just be able to have a repertoire where we can engage in this moment it's so nice to be able to be inspired by people that are alive i, I love socrates i love i love plato i love like there's lots that i love but these are individuals that i have to reach in the past to to garner and to think about but to to have people like you know dr e mcgilchrist's work and matthew's work and walking like i would love to meet these guys i would love to have a conversation with gorilla i would love to like tangle with cuss with gus I, I, my family wants to come up and and hang out with rain and 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 jay like it's so nice to have living inspiration around us Mm -hmm. Yeah, we That's should do a show. Uh, we should get Gorilla involved in a show somehow, sometime, Matt. Uh, he's he's yeah, such fun, absolutely. man. We could do a roundtable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Holmes, Holmes family, he's such a blast. Gorilla, we'll bring yeah, him on. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> the voiceovers that you were doing—they are so good. Do them Amazing. going forward. Yes. They are so good. <laughs> okay. One of our Favorite part. Oh, it's gonna go to his head, and he's next time he's gonna be all like, "Yes, I am the ruler of the world." Can't put that gene back in the bottle. It's out. Do it. Yeah. Do it. Do it. Do it. has just expanded. Yes, <laughs> let's go. Well, thank you guys. No, it's great. I love having an allies like you guys out there too. It really moralizes Cynthia and me. Cynthia actually is she. She was she crashed on a on part two of her uh, her ongoing series on Gladio in South America. Uh, so she would have otherwise have been happy to have been here, but we're looking forward to going and meeting you guys. And if anybody's listening on YouTube or rumble or wherever this is being streamed, um, and you're in Calgary, reach out to us because we're probably going to do a little event in Calgary in a couple of weeks, uh, location yet to be determined, 
Okay, um, cool. So not probably. That. Not probably. So We're then get up on the QR code yep. that's there and get Matt Eretz Substack scanned into your phone and subscribe to Matt Eretz Substack. That way you'll automatically just get emails when the events come out, new articles uh, exposing the new world order, et cetera, et cetera. And congratulations, I see on the YouTube video for Hidden Hand Behind UFOs, you've gotten the Google... Uh, warning underneath about new world order and how that's a common conspiracy on the oh, the, the, the far right <laughs> yeah so that's, so that's there to... we're on the right track <laughs> yeah exactly oh that is so vexing oh, oh, it, it is it's horrific that that's part of a, another video that i'm building I'm, I'm always building about 10 videos and eventually one of them busts through and gets released but one of them right now is this horrible double standard on youtube and uh, I just I just went through my my emails to find the email they sent out at the end of May in 22, saying that if you even suggest that um, Russia was uh, um, had reasons to invade Ukraine, your content will be taken down. If you yeah. even suggest that they um, attack their own people. Uh, or anything like that, your content will be gone. What? You, well, yeah. this, is, this is a YouTube message or an official? Yeah, 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 yeah. April oh, yeah. 22. Yeah, I couldn't oh. believe it. And yeah, of course, don't forget, we, man, we got Trudeau's bill coming in to pass here oh, too. God, so they're, they're they're coming to for stop online hate. Okay, that's it. We're don't even to protect start. the children. <laughs> to protect the children. <laughs> Give me one sec here. This is this is worth sharing. About the kids he's, even the kids he's not having sex with, he he cares. <laughs> Okay, here they just can't say go. anything because they got a sock in their mouth. <laughs> there is the email right there. Dear publisher, due to the war in Ukraine, we will pause monetization of content that exploits, dismisses, or condones the war. This hmm. pause includes, but is not limited to, claims that imply victims are responsible for their own tragedy or similar instances of victim blaming, such as claims that Ukraine is committing genocide or deliberately attacking its own citizens. So Which, you, when you look at any of the videos all over Telegram, you, did, did, <laughs> you know, I there. think you were at twelve thousand. That were, you know, for the best counts of, of who, the, how many of their own citizens they had killed by the time Russia jumped in, mm -hmm. you know, and and but that you can't even refer to that. You yeah. can't even. They're telling you, we we Google is, and that's Google AdSense. That wasn't from YouTube. That was from Google AdSense. So the mama company is just like. Here is the narrative for the world. Anything right. else will be censored. Yeah. God. So I guess we all need to start discussing our contingency plan of moving to Russia. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll that, that is that is the Maybe. I'm just saying, just saying. That is the bug out. <laughs> for me right now, it's the bug out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I go to Sochi, but housing's pretty expensive. We're gonna there. build a commune in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna bring in Tim Kirby into a roundtable, and uh, you know he's spearheading the whole American cities in 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 Russia. Yeah, project. I follow we'll, him we'll get, closely. We'll oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good to have well, things yeah. on the back burner. You never. You, you've talked to him, <laughs> man. If I have to even go back to the rigs to support all of you. I would do it. <laughs> yes. No problem. Yeah, yeah. Because I know that sooner or later you'd have my back and I could actually retire. But yeah, damn <laughs> yeah, straight. Yeah, I'll I'd go do back whatever to whatever I had to do. I'll go back to cooking in Russia. I, I know a pretty good borscht. <laughs> I can make a pretty mean borscht. Oh. Right on. <laughs> well, good. I want that recipe. Okay, <laughs> Holmes. Uh, we're gonna say good night to the Holmes. Thank you for popping in <laughs> and contributing. It's good an again. honor. All right, we'll talk soon. Sure. Good night. Matthew, all right. all right. I think we, uh, I think we lost rain, man. I don't know what happened. He there. was looking tired anyway. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, he worked today. I, I just edited video. I didn't do any work. Cool. Yeah, man. Okay, so uh, we're we're done. We got the premiere out there. Everyone, head over to not YouTube. You can go to BitChute, take a picture of that QR code. You can go to Rumble, take a picture of that QR code. Mm. And watch this film part three in general. Where are we going? It's we get up to like, we reference the Cold War by the end. Where are we headed? 
Yeah, but it, we're not going to do total linearity. There's going to be that's the beauty of this type of series is we we're not bounded by chronology entirely. So we're going to be jumping around a little bit. But I I think the theme of Nikola Tesla is unavoidable. Yeah. Uh, secret science programs before World War One even. Um, all the way up until Manhattan. That's going to be that's going to play into Tesla. Aleister Crowley and the Satanists. Um, that's going to play into the story. Um, and Crowley, uh, Nikola Tesla's handler, who was the president of the British Society for Psychical Research, Will, Sir William Crooks, uh, one of the leading enemies of, um, Harry Houdini, um, will be brought in, who was also the president of the British, um, Royal Society at the same time, um, was a handler, mentor of Tesla, cardboard cutout, and I think we're going to have to talk about them a little bit. Um, cause it does play right into the spiritualist movement. The, um, the society for psychical research is the driving force of a lot of this stuff. The, the revival of the occult and AI. Cause one big thing that Tesla I've, I've discovered was doing was he was, um, advent. He was, he was, <laughs> uh, he's tied to TH Huxley as well. And the X. Oh, yeah. And so Thomas Huxley put out a, a project to try to prove that free will doesn't exist by um, challenging scientists to create a thinking machine, an, an automata. And this is what uh, Tesla did in 1898 was he created the tele, tele uh, automata in New York, presented it and had a, a series of lectures trying to prove that free will no longer needs to be presumed to exist and that these machines will eventually take over humanity. And he was following the uh, the the um, the philosophy of a figure who who was also a, a shaper of H.G. Wells, named Sir Edward Bulwer Lytton, a leader of the Knights of the Order of the Golden Dawn. Oh yeah, he wrote a book on uh, on the future humans living inside the Earth and the Vril Society, which was also adopted by the Nazis a yes. little bit later on. <laughs> Holy crap! Fluid. <laughs> that was their idea of what the ether was that connects us to deities and, and, and demons from another dimension interfacing with ours through mediums and what have you. So all of the stuff, I, I don't have it yet in my mind as a integrated whole properly yet, but all of the elements are floating about. I know they have to be pulled into. This a is where we got to go. This is where we got to go. Yeah, and then yeah. the idea is to then like bring it up to the post-World War II appearance of flying saucers and the new illusionist tricks around that with uh, Sir Henry Tizard, who plays a key role. He's the guy who gave Zillar the patents, who created the Manhattan Project. He was introduced British. in this this episode. Yeah, he was introduced yeah. in this episode. He's going to come back into play as the founder of the first major government UFO working group um, after the war, and um, and a certain grouping of occultists working with the CIA will be introduced without saying too much. We're going to leave that for episode four. So right. somehow it'll all tie together. Bam! Yeah, can't wait. I, I just can't wait to get the Nazis because pictures are going to be easy to find as an yeah. editor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have some of those. This one was brutal. There was that Scottish astronomer. Oh, and there's the literally red. one picture yeah. of him on the internet, and it's yeah. this big. Yeah, well, you you know you you made it work, and <laughs> well, uh, AI what? again, AI upscaling at least lets me make that picture into this picture yeah that was yeah. <laughs> good it was a good fix and and i loved what you well, cynthia and i both were just so amazed and, and impressed with your choices especially the ed asner clip that that fused so nicely it weaved it into the story so well and um the clip also on um uh the end where you have the the war of the worlds um uh, being sh where you're you're hearing it from the radio broadcast in 1938 but then you actually see the illusionists at the radio station making all the sound effects yes, so that's what i loved great. about it it's yeah so yeah good. the guy's got that big disc and like oh they're opening the saucer oh my gosh and he's like oh the human coming out what is it so yeah. cool yeah that and that was a complete accident because i was looking for some kind of footage to fill that in with and then i didn't even know that that movie existed me neither. There's Ed Ad Asner. There's a couple other big people in it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I love those little surprises that come along. 
And I love that when I drop them in that they work, that it works with you guys. It's so much fun because nobody's expecting it. I'm not expecting it. You're not expecting it. And blammo, something new comes out of it. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Fantastic. All right, Matt. Well, uh, we'll take off for now. Let's yep. let's watch. Everyone's you, you, you got to go. Got to go watch this. Come on, people. We're heading somewhere big with it. And then uh, we're moving on to, I think, uh, Cynthia's next video. Uh, on uh, escaping Calypso's Island, escaping the green death hell. <laughs> I forgot yeah. the whole subtitle. Um, the green like delusion. Um, yeah. yeah. And we're going to get into some more realistic uh, questions about the whole green agenda. Yes. So that, that'll be the next video up in line. And super spreaders will, of course, be dropping stuff from time to time as well. So thank you for joining us. Much appreciated, Matt. All right. Always a pleasure. Thank you. And great job, Jason. Pat Thank yourself you. on the back. You did a fantastic, fantastic job. It was great. Thank you. It's always easy with a great script. Thanks, man. All right. Good. Take care. Bye. Good night. All right, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, uh, we're sorry for not posting for uh, the better part of two months. We had some weird health stuff going on and had to kind of balance out uh, personal time with shows soon i'm getting some technical errors sorry if i'm blipping out everybody uh and uh we'll be back uh soon love y'all and let's spread it if we're allowed to